I bought this Heathkit capacitor substitution box about 25 years ago at a ham radio swap meet, and I've been using it ever since. Uh, I got curious to see what's inside because I'd never really opened it up, and I thought you might want to look at it too. So inside you can see whoever built it did a fairly nice job of assembling it. Um, uh, they didn't remove the flux, but uh, um, it seems to be, you know, well-constructed. All the capacitors have a tolerance of 10% or better. All but three of the capacitors are 600 to 1000 volt film capacitors. So there should be no voltage dependence or very little voltage dependence of the capacitance applied voltage. And the smallest three capacitors are 500 volt silver mica capacitors, which are very high quality capacitors as well. So here's another look. You can see here that the, the silver mic is 5% and the one behind it is 3%. If you look at the orange capacitor there, you could, the big orange one on the left, you can see this is 1,000 volts. The rest of them are 600 volts. So I'm curious now is how good this box is and what frequency range it's use, usable for. So I measured the complex impedance from 100 hertz up to 10 megahertz using the, the Bode plot function on the Siglet scope, the Siglet function generator, and the Tektronix current probe. If you're interested in how I did this measurement, I have a whole video I did uh, last year on just this uh, procedure, and I'll link to it below. So this is the impedance results, and you can see here, you know, it looks they look like capacitors. They come down, and they resonate. The big capacitor resonates at the lowest frequency, and as the capacitors get smaller, the resonant frequency moves up. The, va the, the bottom of the valley of each one of these plots is approximately the resonant frequency. Now, if we look here, this is the phase of the impedance. And so you can see here at, at low frequency, there's some noise in the small capacitors, but that's not, not unexpected. But you can see here, even the biggest capacitor at 200 kilohertz essentially still looks like a capacitor. So if you use this thing at 200 kilohertz or below, it's just a capacitor. You don't have to worry about it. It's when you get above that, you have to start thinking about what's going on. And so um, I was kind of curious uh, to what the equivalent circuit model would be of this box. So if I used it, I could put it in a simulation. So we see here are all the capacitances I've measured at various uh over the whole frequency range. This is all the different switch positions. You can see they're spaced out nicely in a little over three decades of coverage. That's very useful. Now, if we take the, the uh, uh, capacitance and the resonant frequency for each capacitor, where uh, the blue one is the indicated capacitance on the box and the, the uh, yellow squares are the capacitance I, that that measure, method measured at 20 kilohertz, and we plotted on a capacitance versus uh, resonant frequency plot, log log, we get essentially what looks almost like a straight line. So if we look at the capacitant resonant frequency formula for capacitance and rewrite it so C is a function of uh, resonant frequency, and then pick a inductor of 200 nanohenries, we see we get a pretty good fit to the data. So this 200 nanohenries, the reason it's not changing and it's so big is most of that is the wiring in the box, not the capacitors it's themselves. Uh, the, the series uh, uh, inductance of even one of those big film capacitors is usually in the low tens of nanohenries. So all this, this stuff is coming from the wiring, but it looks fairly fixed over the whole range. So now if we look at the series resistance we measured... We can see here that they bunch up down here at a, a few ohms. Uh, the the smaller values are a little noisy, which is somewhat somewhat to be expected. But I'm just going to eyeball this and say about, about half an ohm is probably a good number for everything. So if I were to use this in a, you know, take a measurement and then want to do a simulation based on that measurement, this is the circuit model I would use for the box. Half an ohm of series resistance, 
200 nano hairs of serious inductance in whatever capacitance value I had it switched to. Now you have to be careful if you go to use this because this is the model at the uh, uh, banana terminals on the box. If you add leads to that to connect to your circuit, those leads are going to add addition additional inductance you're going to need to account for. So now I want to... I go, well, here, I'm going to measure this thing with everything I have in the lab that measures capacitance. So the first thing I have is this uh, old military LCR bridge. This thing was designed in 1956, and this particular unit, I think, was built about 1963. But it, it's very nice. It will measure capacitances without charge or with voltages up to 800 volts. So it's a little dangerous because it puts the voltage on, the, on these uh, terminals here, and you can get a very nasty shock if you're not careful. Not that I know anything about that. And, um, but it's a, you know, very nice instrument. And so the, but it only measures at one kilohertz. Now these are all the other meters I have in the lab that measure capacitance. So the first, the three up at the top are really all the same meter. They're a WinHY VC28-2 is the OEM. And they're rebranded by various Chinese companies and sold. They're 20,000 count meters with one picofarad resolution. And I paid less than $20 for each one of these. And they're probably the meters I use the most in the lab. If you could pick up one of these for under 20 bucks, it's a good deal. The next meter I have over here is a capacitance meter that I've had for probably at least 25 years, maybe 35 years. I've had this thing for a long time. It's a 2,000 count meter, uh, manually switched, but on the lowest range, it has 100 femtofarad resolution. Next meter we have is a Fluke 101. It's a 6,000 count meter. It doesn't measure very small capacitors well because the, the lowest range, the, the lowest resolution is 10 picofarads. But if I'm going to go measure AC lines or something where I'm could get big transients or something, this is the meter I grab. This is the only meter of all these here that I would uh, trust for doing that. Now here, these ANIG meters are both cheap meters. This eight, AN8008 AN is a very common 10,000 count meter. Um, and it could be picked up for around 20 bucks or less if you if you look as well. And um, it measures, it's got a resolution of one picofarad. Now this Aneg 819A I bought because it has, a, you know, a very big display and I wanted to, I thought that would be good for videos, but I'm very disappointed with it for many other reasons. Um, but it has, it's a 2000 count meter with 10 picofarad resolution. This EEV blog meter is, I paid over $200 for. It's a 50,000 count meter, so probably the highest resolution meter I have here. And it does a lot of things well. Unfortunately, messy measuring capacitance is not one of them. The Unity U10E is a 2,000 count meter, and I bought it because it's one of the few clamp meters made that measures current. And it's and so I really bought it for that, not for measuring capacitance, but I it measures capacitance as well, so I included it in the group. And lastly, here we have this Dura EE LCR meter. This has 10 femtofarad resolution on the lowest range, and um, it's an excellent meter for measuring components. Um, it's very quick if you just want to plug them in. The issue I have with it, if you put leads on it, you then have to do a cal, and the calibration procedure is very slow. Now, all these meters over here in this yellow circle, are, or yellow outline, are time-to-charge measurements. So what they, they work by putting a fixed current on the capacitor and then measuring how quickly the capacitor charges to a voltage or changes between two voltages. 
by, and by timing that, they get a capacitance measurement. The, this, the DUR-EE meter actually does complex AC measurements at all these different frequencies. And from the complex AC measurements, it measures the real and imaginary parts of the current and voltage and computes the uh, um, um, real and imaginary parts of impedance and then the component values from that. Um, it's a very handy lab instrument to have, and I'm happy I bought it. It's just ungodly slow if you use leads. So using all those meters and the bridge, this is all the data I took. I don't expect you, you to look too much at this. I'm just going to show some details of how I took the data. Here's all the meters. Now the DUR-EE uh, LCR meter, I measured at all the frequencies it's capable of measuring at. This is the, the uh, antique LCR bridge. And then I tossed in some measurements from the, uh, the impedance sweep I did with the scope. And I used 1 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz, because those all correspond to frequencies here. And then the 1 megahertz, too. And these are the values I measured. <clears throat> now, if we plot all the data on the same plot, this is what we get. So you can see here, up in the legend, you can see everything. I plotted, and you can see it all corresponds pretty well until we start getting down below 2 nanofarads and things start varying off. These two anag meters and the EEV blog meter starts dropping down quite a bit. <coughs> and in fact, the EEV blog meter will uh, measure zero for anything below about 60 uh, picofarads. Now we're looking at a plot. This is the percent difference from the uh, value marked on the box that I'm measuring with the meters. So you can see here that this 10 nanofarad capacitor in the box, because everything's measuring low, is probably that capacitor is probably off by about 10 <laughs> percent, right right at its tolerance rating. The rest seem to be much better. Um, this point over here on the ZM11U. Um, and here is the, on the high range, I think the capacitors it uses in the bridge circuit are becoming leaky after 50 years. And that's causing some issues. I just haven't been motivated to go in and fix it. But I suspect that's the problem. But if we look down here below 2 nanofarads, again, we can see the big variance of all the meters. The ANEG 819, which is just a cheap piece of junk, varies a lot. It's off at 100 picofarads. It's reading 150% too high. The N8008 is starting to veer off everything as well. But the EEV blog meter is reading way too low. So what's the conclusion to all this? The Heath Kit capacitor substitution box is a very highly usable range of 100 picofarads to, 20, to 0.22 microfarads. It's made with high-quality capacitors. All the values are usable to at least 200 kilohertz, if not higher, and but up to 200 kilohertz without even worrying about it. The 500-volt rating makes it great for tube circuits and also usable on uh, uh, lower-voltage main circuits as well. Now, for capacitance, me the capacitance measurements, the impedance sweep method was the most informative, but it's slow and cumbersome to set up. So I don't do it very often, but it was useful as an exercise for this. The time to charge measurements built into most modern meters work well and are fast and easy. However, the ANEG meters and the EEV blog meters well, are all very disappointing since they do not work well for capacitors below 2 nanofarads. The DUR-EE DE5000 meter works well, but calibration with leads is slow. And the ZM11-U is a nice unit because it measures with applied voltages up to 800 volts. I didn't do that here, but that's really one of the most useful things it does. It also measures leakage current it's in uh, electrolytic capacitors, which is good if you work in old tube gear.
So which meters do I regularly use? For most things, I, I grab one of the WinHY VC28-2 meters because uh, they're just quick and easy. And if I want a more accurate uh, measurement or, you know, I want to find out more about how the part works over frequency or interested in dissipation factor, I'll use the Dura-EE LCR meter. Anyway, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more videos from me, consider subscribing. And if you want to be notified when I post another video, hit the notification icon or the bell. Anyway, thank you for watching.